We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Hello friends, lots of shout outs because I'm trying to catch up but I do want to tell you that it's almost time for the exclusive extra episode and newsletter for our patrons. I'll tell you later in this episode what the extra episode is because then it will make sense. Oh God, that comes around very quickly. Oh, it's like a herpes outbreak. Not that I would know what that's like or judge anyone who would know, especially any of these good people if they do know. That's fine. Wendy Smith, Jesse, Nicole McGuinness, Sally Beaton, would never judge you, Sally, Amy Hogan, Sophie Stafford, Your Body, Your Rules, Sophie, Susanna Perith Kinston, Susanna Pierith Kinston, perhaps even. Good one. Love a double bunger. If you know what I mean, Susanna, no judgment. Tilly Lanyon, Annette Bretag, Bretag, good name, Natasha Brown, Casey Porter, Nicole Bowden, Bree Stephenson or Stevenson, Naomi Myers, Sarah Penn, I think it's Sarah, because there's no H on the end, Kate Widdop, Sarah Kohler, H on the end, Madison Hope, Rach Salmon, Brooke Miller, Paige Wright, Jasmine Ward, Karen Stringfellow, oh that's wonderful, Stringfellow, let's all have a moment, Karen. Karen Stringfellow, Willow McCauley, also wonderful. Paul Hickey, terrific, no problems there. Kelly Herman, Lisa Hall, Kelly Downs, Duncan Scott, Edwina Marsh. Oh, Edwina, how wonderful. You'd never have herpes. Edwina. Oh, delightful. Sorry about all of that. If you'd like to become a patron, patreon.com forward slash pod. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. That country up there, it's, I won't say lawless, but there are characters in there, uh, loners, drifters, people who go in with no support, um, no family, some of them, no friends. If they don't come out, nobody knows. And there's, there's talk that there's more than one person that's gone missing up there at, at the hands of these people. Episode 104 of Australian True Crime is a favourite among our listeners. It features Far North Queensland journalist Robert Reed talking about a case that's become a very personal affair for him that of the supposed murder-suicide of Vicky Arnold and Julianne Lay. Mrs Arnold and the Arnold family stuck by their guns and refused to believe that Vicky did that and never could have done such a thing. She was a gentle person. They had no history of violence, had no history of mental issues, and yet she was supposed to have cold-bloodedly murdered her best friend, no motive whatsoever and then commit suicide on this lonely bush track. It never made sense then, and it doesn't. They were lazy country coppers, even though two of them smelt a rat. They were overruled. Well, it's very rare that uh, there's murder-suicides involving women, and certainly I, um, at that time there had never, ever been anything like that, had there? Like, it's, it's just women don't tend to brutally murder like that. So, I mean, that's just a bit of pop psychology, I guess, but there's stats to back that up. Yes, there are. I I broke the story about police officers from Townsville coming up on the day of the funerals. Both women were buried on the same day in the funeral parlour, cutting their hands off because they'd neglected to take fingerprints. I remember that story now. You mentioned that. It's horrifying. They had... They said later, when I found out who it was, that they had to take their hands back to Townsville and put put them in a special solution so they could get the fingerprints. And when uh, I found that out, I was talking to a, a copper on the phone in Townsville and he blurted it out. And I said, so it was you? And he said, yeah, it was me. And, and in the end, months later, it was ordered that the, uh, the bodies were exhumed, taken back to the uh, funeral parlour and the hands were put back in the fresh coffins of the deceased. Robert is back this week to talk about the case at the centre of his new book, 
And again, he continues to work very closely with the victim's family in the pursuit of justice. Murder on the River of Gold is a truly chilling story set in a part of Australia that most of us will never see with our own eyes. And that's just the way the locals like it. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims and what happens next. Bruce Schuler was living a relaxed life with his wife Fiona in Cooktown and escaping for the odd weekend away with mates to the historic Palmerville Goldfields, deep in the bush of Queensland's Cape York. It's wild country, closer to Port Moresby than to Brisbane. It's unforgiving and it's inhabited by very tough people. Right in the middle of it is Palmerville Station, which was, in 2012, the isolated kingdom of Stephen and Diane Struber, who'd become increasingly eccentric, shall we say, about protecting their territory. Like everyone else in the area, Bruce and his mates knew to keep an eye out for the Strubers, but they crossed paths nonetheless on Monday, July 9, 2012, and Bruce has never been seen or heard of again. Emily spoke to Robert Reed about this extraordinary case, and they began with the landscape of Cape York and the Palmerville Goldfields that plays such a powerful role in this story. It's strange country. It's, it's chilling country, really. And it's country where you wouldn't want to be walking around on your own. Explain to us really the vastness of this property, this land where Bruce was, was murdered. It, it's huge, isn't it? It is. It's huge. Palmerville Station itself is huge. And then, of course, the surrounding area includes the historic town of Maytown, which historically was the main centre of goldfields going way back over 100 years. And so the area is steeped in history. People came from California and all over Australia to, to look for gold on the Palmer River. And then the latest gold rush, of course, starting in the 60s and 70s, were the advent of people looking for gold with metal detectors. And that started, started a mini gold rush. People went there with their, with their metal detectors looking for gold. And these two, for the best part of 20 years, and increasingly so, chased people off the part of the river that went through the property and surrounding areas. Stephen and Diane, you know, when you look at the photos of them after their arrest, I mean, they're, Diane looks like a really tough bushwoman, you know, who's lived a pretty hard life. What can you tell us about both of them, where they came from? How did they end up together? Well, Diane has spent her entire life there from the age of two and really left the property except for uh, perhaps a family wedding or a funeral. She had no social life, very unsophisticated, worked like a man on the property, killed beasts for food and did all those things that men do on these stations. Stephen came along. He was a handyman type bloke. He could weld, he could fix engines and he worked on properties around the area, stations around the area and he ended up at Palmerville and did, did jobs for Diane's parents at first and then he became a regular there and Diane's father died and then her mother and Stephen well before she died she said to Stephen and Diane if you get married I'll give you the property and that's what happened so Stephen was there and he became attached to Diane although they both say never romantically but they quote unquote care for each other both of them said this independently. So so the, the station ended up basically in Stephen Struber's hands through his association with Diane, and the rest occurred then. And she must have become indoctrinated by his behaviour and, and became just like him. And that's the story of these two. She says she was never physically, physically assaulted by him, uh, but I do believe that she's been moulded in his shape, moulded in his mindset by him, perhaps not even knowing it. So it's a very, very strange case. How did they make a living on their property? Well, it's a cattle, it's a cattle property and there are cattle there. Um, 
Diane's brother runs the runs the station at the moment. He's caretaking the property. The, the property's been it's 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 for sale. It's been listed for sale by the public trustee. Now D- Diane, Diane and Stephen, although they're in jail, they are still the legal owners of the property. Uh, but there's there's debts there's debts on the property that have to be covered, lawyers' debts and further further debts. Um, so the public trustee is overseeing the sale of the property, and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, uh, but certainly there's, there's debts owing, the, the, and and as you asked, um, there are cattle there, and they'd sell a, a few head of cattle. Uh, George is running his, uh, her her brother. He, he sells cattle and gradually tries to pay off the debt, but he can't. It's, it's too vast. So it's a cattle station, but those in the know up there, cattlemen I've spoken to, would say that the country is so brutal, cattle can't live there. They're not in good condition, and there's not enough feed. It's just sparse country, not enough feed for many cattle. You run a few hundred head, but you wouldn't make money out of cattle. So they lived a Spartan existence there by the sale of a few cattle, to my knowledge, they were not involved in gold prospecting themselves. Uh, so I think they lived, well, the old saying, they lived on the smell of an oily rag. Yeah, well, when you saw the photos of them, the police photos after they'd been arrested, it just looked like they lived a very hard life. You can see from photos of the homestead yes. inside and out. It's really just a tin shed. Yeah, it is. Mm. It's like a corrugated iron kind of construction, isn't it? With yeah, a few that, things in it. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. That, that's what it is. What area of Queensland are we talking about here? We're talking the biggest town of any note would be would be Cooktown. So we're well, well up on the Cape. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura, the, it's only a little, little spot on the map. It's got a pub and a hall and that's about it. The nearest police... Apart from the lone policeman at Laura is Cooktown, and then you've got a long way south to, to Cairns. So it, it's a it's a vast wilderness area with rivers flowing and gullies, and I would describe it as a badlands in the American sense of the word. The Americans call it badlands, and I would call that area Australia's badlands. And why is that? Is that because of the isolated nature of it or the fact that there's some fearsome characters up there? Well, yeah, and of course there are drugs up there too. It's so isolated that you could say that those that live up there grow a bit of dope. And I mean, that that's not a capital offence and it, it's no reason to be violent. So the Struvers, in their defence at the trial, claimed that they weren't there. In fact, Stephen Struber gave evidence... And he said it nine times, we weren't there. And the defence painted a picture of perhaps it was a drug deal gone wrong by the other other witnesses there, that perhaps they were involved in drugs and something went bad and Bruce was killed. That didn't happen because these two were seen there. But that, getting back to your question, is that kind of country, badlands, that yes, uh, marijuana is grown by some, and so isolated that they're rarely, rarely ever arrested for it, and it doesn't matter anyway. They're out there on their own, not hurting anyone if they grow a bit of dope. So it's a sinister place, and if you're up there as I as I have been, uh, you don't want to be around walking around on your own. Mm. Is the way I describe it. It's, it's chilling. It's sinister. It's scary. Uh, by the nature of the area, you know you're so isolated that if something happens, you could never be found. Diane and Stephen, these two became notorious for driving up. Diane would be sitting in the vehicle, clearly holding a rifle upright in her lap, and Stephen would go down to the campers or the prospectors and say, get off our land even if they weren't on any of their land. And so they became a a sort of a Bonnie and Clyde. I don't want to over-dramatise it, but they were uh, kings of their castle and just there was no control over them. One of the local policemen there, he tried to tell his 
hierarchy in Cairns. I need help up here. Send somebody up. These two are out of control. Something bad's going to happen. And it did. Yeah, it's, I certainly got the sense of you mentioned that Bonnie and Clyde ish nature of how they operated. So people were on the land, but they were allowed to be on the land, weren't they? How did that work? Struber's owned Palmerville Station, but how did it work with people going on the land? They certainly owned or leased the land, long term leaseholders. They inherited from Diane's mother. After they got married, after after these two got married, the property was was given over to to them. And as soon as that happened, this intimidation started, and gradually increased. Now, Palmer River runs through their property for a distance of approximately 60 k's, and the law states actually that people are misconceived about what is trespassing. Most people believe that you can camp on a river and nobody owns the river, and so you're legal. But in fact, if a watercourse goes through a property, then you are legal on the water, but if you step off onto each side of that river or creek, then you are actually trespassing. So in a sense, they were right. But you don't kill people for trespassing. And that, and they took that law unto themselves outside the river and off their property as well. They roamed freely for, as I said, the best part of two decades. So they became untouchable. And because there was only one there's only one police officer at any given time at Laura, the nearest small not even a town, small settlement, a one pub area, there's only ever been one police officer there who has to he has to look after a very, very big area. And it's not possible to watch them all the time. And so they became a law unto themselves. And anyone who turned up, if they heard, they would lock gates against even council workers who were doing uh, lawful roadworks. Uh, technicians who are repairing towers, communication towers, they approached everyone and ordered them off the land, even if it wasn't theirs. It was indeed a lawless state of affairs for all that time. Bruce was a retired builder. He had his own building business and he retired. He bought a, a leasehold, uh, not on the river, but not far away. He built a, a substantial shed house on it and uh, he and his wife lived in Cooktown. They had a business there, a video store and Bruce was, he loved fossil king, gold fossil king. He would go to his leasehold and fossil with mates and on his own and that was a joy for him just to get out into the wilderness and fossil and find a bit of gold and that's what he was doing when he was brutally killed. Our patrons will receive an exclusive extra episode this weekend featuring an interview with Bruce Shuler's widow, Fiona Split, whose tireless work lobbying the Queensland Governor-General was instrumental in having the no-body, no-parole laws passed in that state. As a consequence, neither Diane nor Stephen Struber will be considered for parole unless and until they divulge the whereabouts of the remains of Fiona's husband, Bruce. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash Pod, and when you do that, you'll have access to the entire back catalogue. There's a link in the show notes and on our Facebook page. After the break, author and journalist Robert Reed talks about visiting one of Bruce's convicted killers in prison. Coming up on Australian True Crime, Queensland journalist and author Robert Reed offers a theory as to why Bruce's killers would rather spend the rest of their lives in jail than reveal where they left Bruce's remains. But first, Bruce Shuler's friends offer the closest thing to witness accounts of what happened to Bruce on Palmerville Station. Someone you spoke to at length, Tremaine Anderson, who had had some pretty scary experiences with the couple. He was a mate of Bruce's, wasn't he? Yes, Tremaine Anderson. 
Dan Bidner and Rusty Groff. They were the three witnesses there. They were the three people with, with Bruce. And uh, they were close mates, yes. Tremaine and Dan had been in the area a long, long time, and they knew these two, and uh, they kept well away from them. But, of course, driving to and from um, Mariba or Chilligo, they, they would encounter them, and shots were fired above Tremaine's head. And whether they were fired directly at him and missed, he's not sure, but he was very much afraid. And at one stage, he was metal detecting, and then suddenly he was pushed forward. He thought it was a beast. He thought it might have been a bull. And that was from behind, and it was Stephen Struber. And Tremaine got up off the floor of the gully and rushed up the hill at him and then thought better of it and got out of there because here was somebody in the vehicle, Diane, with a gun. And so he was very angry, Tremaine. But caution got the better part of Vella, and away he, he, he took off and got out of there. And other stories like this, there was one other prospector who was dragged out of his car and bashed by somebody and one of the crew, one of their crew. And these things happened periodically. And the, the lone policeman tried his very best to get as many people to come forward as he could. But the nature of mining and fossicking is that it's so isolated that most of these incidents were not reported because it was too too hard. All they wanted to do was get on and find some gold. So a lot of this stuff went under the, under the carpet. Stephen and Diane Struber ambushed Bruce Schuler, who was metal detecting for gold on the Palmer River, on a, on a dry gully leading into the Palmer River. In July 2012, there were three of his mates in the area but spread out a bit because when you use a metal detector, you ha have to have distance between each one, otherwise they interfere with each other. So Bruce's mates were out of sight of him but in the area, in the area. And they saw the vehicle, they saw the ute pull up on a ridge above the gully where Bruce was and one of the uh, one of Bruce's mates knew it was the vehicle of the Strubers, and two of the three mates saw the Strubers in the vehicle, and so there was no question that they were there. They were seen then, out of their sight, out of the witness's sight. There were two gunshots. One appeared to be a rifle shot and one appeared to be a louder report that suggested it was a, a, a large caliber handgun. And so although there were no witnesses to the actual killing, there were certainly witnesses to the fact that those two were there when the gunshots were fired. So the police put together a, a very compelling case, circumstantial case, no witnesses, no body, and three missing firearms. But it was such well put together case that the jury, the jury accepted the fact that the killers were these two, and so they were jailed for life. It still wouldn't reveal where they put the body of Bruce Shula. It seems to me that the gold fossicking community, even though these guys sort of do stuff in isolation, there is a camaraderie with them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. They, they are rough and ready people. Um, uh, some of them live there. Some of them never come out of there. They, they just fossick or maybe come down for supplies to either Mariba or, or Chiligo, and then they go back again. And so some of them spend most of their time there. And some of them find gold. Some of them make reasonably good money. But it's a harsh life. They'll ride trail bike out into the hills on their own looking for gold. And if they didn't come back, nobody would know in some cases. So you get a picture of the vastness of this country standing on a hill. I, I said to the one of them, it's Remain actually, we were standing on a high, high hill and a 360-degree view of the mountains in the distance. And I said to Jermaine, 
you could ride into those hills and stay there for months, couldn't you, Tremaine? And nobody would know you were there. He said, Robert, nobody would know. Nobody could find me. So you've got bushmen like this, and they come and go. If somebody didn't come out who didn't have family and friends to inquire about them, nobody would know. And there's there's some talk that there's been people who haven't come out, people like that, loners, and that Bruce isn't the only one. It makes sense when you get a sense of uh, the vastness of this country and there's a range called the Conglomerates, which is a uh, limestone cave uh, range, mountain range. And some of that area has never been seen before. Nobody's got in there uh, because it's too harsh. So wh wherever they put Bruce, it's hard to think that he'll ever be found unless they tell us. Yeah, that's what I found so tragic is that Bruce hasn't been found and his partner Fiona that has really lobbied hard, as you said, for the nobody, no parole rule to come in. Also, they had children. Yeah. She described it as Bruce has just been murdered and discarded somewhere yep. in the bush. You've met Fiona, obviously. Oh, yes, I saw her today, actually. She's moved down from Cooktown. She'd had enough. And she's moved down to a family property they've got near near Mariba, where I live. And I see her from time to time. We talk on the phone. And because this is not over, because Bruce hasn't been found, and all efforts to get them to talk, including my own efforts and the police, have failed. And I have looked into Diane's eyes and said, tell me, where's Bruce? And she repeatedly said, I wasn't there, Robert, and it's chilling because she was there. She was seen there, and Bruce didn't come back. When I said this is not over, it's not over for the family. It's not over for me because I never met him, but I feel like I know him. And he's out there. His remains are out there somewhere. But I said to Diane... It, it won't matter if Bruce is found by somebody else or a bone turns up down the track and it ha happens to, to once belong to Bruce. That won't help you. You have to tell because you won't get parole unless it's you that lead police to where you put Bruce. And she would just answer me with, I wasn't there, Robert. So I won't admit to something I didn't do, even if I have to spend the rest of my days in prison. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. Uh, this is pretty chilling stuff. Yeah, well, I was pretty gripped when I was reading about your face-to-face -face with Diane because you, you write to both Stephen and Diane to request permission to visit them in prison and you described Stephen never responded. Is that correct? He sent my letter back unopened, returned to sender. Diane responded in a childish scrawl. Mm. When I wrote to her, I said what I was doing. I'm writing a book on your case. And in the interest of fairness and, uh, and completeness, I'd like to talk to you about it. And she wrote back and said, I'd be happy to talk to you, Mr. Reid. Then I went through the process of applying. And you aren't allowed to interview prisoners anymore in Queensland. And so they had, authorities had my letter, her letter agreeing to see me. And I filled in the appropriate forms. And they knew of course, doing a search that I'd been a journalist and I was writing a, writing the book. They knew that. Then the police check is done, and uh, they had to they had to allow me to visit her because uh, you're not allowed to take pencil, paper, recording devices, nothing, into the visiting room. So uh, officially, I was a visitor. Uh, and I didn't interview her. I spoke to her. And so it came to the fact that I was interviewing her, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, um, and so it led to the chapter face-to-face -face with Diane. Potentially, Diane could die in jail then if she's not going to reveal where the body is. Was she in her late 40s when she was arrested or in her 50s? Yeah, late 50s, yeah. I emphasise this with her. Diane, you'll die here unless you tell the police where you put the body. 
And she said, well, I don't want to die here. I'd sooner be up on the property with my animals. But I will not admit to something I didn't do. And so I'll stay here and I know I'll die here. And she has that demeanour that she has accepted her fate and is looking at a lifetime in prison. And I believe his demeanour is the same at Lotus Green, another prison, that they both accepted the fact that they'll die in prison. But we have to ask ourselves, why would they do that? Because they're convicted of the murder and they were clearly there. Why would this be? Why would they accept their fate of dying in prison? Because if they told where Bruce, where they put Bruce, then when they've done the lifetime sentence, which could be 10 years, 12, 15, mm. they would be eligible for parole and the parole board would probably look upon them favourably because they've revealed what they did with the body and they would in time be released. But they won't be released without, with the no body, no parole law in place. So it's black and white. They won't get out unless they tell us where Bruce is. What's your theory behind that? To me, I sound quite delusional, like they were sort of in their own kind of conspiracy type lifestyle and quite isolated. So really, they didn't have a lot of a reality check. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do know what you mean. The isolation part of it, it, it could partly be that. It wouldn't solely be that. But the people who live up there and 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 know the country or know the history of the country, I've heard this story and I didn't believe it at first when I started on this book, but I believe it now, that where they put Bruce, there's somebody else. Uh huh. And the police believe that too, even though they have no they have no reports of missing people who've gone missing people who've gone gone up there and not come out. However, the police concede too that there could be people going in there and not come out and not be missed. Yep. Um, I'm of the belief now, uh, I try to avoid conspiracies, and I thought at first this was a conspiracy, but uh, there's no other reason that I can think of. Why wouldn't they tell us where he is? What is out there? The police say, have told me that where we, if, if we found Bruce, we'd find the guns, We'd find a missing tarp that they had on the back of their ute, often. And we'd find bullet holes in Bruce's head and body. And we might find something else. And so it, it's not out of the question that there could be somebody else that they've killed in the past. It's pretty, it's pretty disturbing and horrible, but um, that country lends itself to these really weird and terrible events. What now for Fiona? Obviously, Fiona did all that really intense advocacy for the nobody, no parole rule, but how's Fiona going? She's going well. Uh, she's strong, she's resolute, and still grieving, of course. Bruce didn't come home. Her husband didn't come home. She's angry because... They won't reveal where where they put him. If the property sells, when the property sells, she's hoping that the new owners would let her and her family go there and have a search around for for Bruce. But she knows in her heart, like I know, that they're not going to find Bruce on Palmerville Station because he's not there. It'd be a, a a symbolic thing for the family to go, to be welcome, to go on the property and walk around. So um, she's going all right. She's strong and um, hoping that one day they'll say, we put Bruce, Bruce, we took Bruce here and put him there. But having said that, in her mind, she's doubtful if that'll come to pass. So it's pretty sad, and, and Bruce's daughter and son, brothers, and it's it's uh, the stone in the pond thing, the ripple effect. Stephen and Diane.
like, are they able to keep in contact with each other? Like, even though they're both yeah. in jail? Yeah, they're able to make a um, certain amount of phone calls, communicate, and they do because I've asked her that, and they do. Why do you think she agreed to see you so many times if she, all she was telling you was, I wasn't there, I don't know anything? I asked her that. She said, well, look, she had, one of my books was found in the, in the house. Okay. By police. Oh, wow. By police. You did a podcast on it, the Atherton lady. Yep. Yeah. So she had probably read that. Um, and anyway, she answered my question by saying, well, you might find something that everybody's missed. I said, oh, okay. Um, I, I, you know I'm writing the book and I, I won't be writing anything I don't believe. And she said, oh, I understand that. I know that. And, um, but she said, you might just find something. So she could have been using me mm -hmm. as an outside, outside the police to investigate and find out uh, something that might put suspicion on somebody else rather than them. Okay. Uh, another reason is perhaps she just wanted somebody to visit her. Yeah. Because uh, the police would, would talk to her from time to time, trying to get her to reveal where they put the body. I know that she enjoyed my visits because I'd ask her how she's getting on in there, was she treated properly and uh, those sort of things. And, and also I'd ask her about her life her life on the station, her family, her mother, her father, her brothers and sisters, um, those sort of things which I think she enjoyed delving into the past and, and telling me about her her family life. So it could be that – that could be the reason. It sounds like she didn't have many friends. She was very much – it was just her and her family and then Stephen. Yes, and the family, George, her brother, because he was caretaking the property, he didn't, well, when I spoke to her, he hadn't visited her at all. And so there are very few that visited her because she's in Townsville Women's Correctional Centre. That's a fair distance from where we all are up here around Cairns and the Tableland. So she wouldn't have had many visitors at all. But I was going down once a month to see her and I'm, I'm sure she looked forward to the visits. Yeah, I can understand. You You know, you've got someone who's talking to you, you know, and interested in you and in your what you have to say. So I get it, you know, and she's probably quite lonely. Yes, but I think she's in there. She's not going to talk. I don't believe they'll talk. I really don't believe that they, they're going to tell us where Bruce is. And I think she looks better there than she did in those early, early photos. And as she said to me, Robert, there are a lot of people worse off than me. I can walk out into the yard, feel the sunshine and the breeze and talk to people. And the staff are, are nice. They're not brutal like in the, in the movies. But prisoners are well treated now. She seems resigned to the fact that this is her life now. Robert Reed's book about this case is called Murder on the River of Gold and it's available for you to buy from the bookshop on our website, australiantruecrimepodcast.com. Thank you for downloading this episode. We'll be back next week.